Now, I have tried to record this video about three different times. The first time I wasn't happy with how it looked. The second time I wasn't happy with my presentation. And the third time, this little microphone here just didn't work. But now I have it working, and now I'm ready to rumble. Originally, I was going to try and phrase it like I'm a teacher giving an online class, but I realized the people who need to see this video won't watch it if they think it's someone pretending to be a teacher. Now, if you have people like the architect Milo, who likes pretending he's a teacher and slams books on the table and says, class is in session, I think that's awesome because that's my demographic. But the people that need to see this video will not watch it. So, I'm going to use my best editing skills. I'm going to try and move around as much as I can. Maybe I'll have some subway surfers playing over here just to keep the people who need to watch this engaged. Now, originally I wanted to teach everyone about capitalism. But I thought I might get a little bit too heated in the moment if I was tasked with doing that. So instead, I'm going to talk about the little device that is filming me right now. Okay. Maybe I could like hang this somewhere. Interesting. But you can't see, so I could actually just put that like here so I can just stare at it. So okay, we've got bits that we can cut out. We'll just link them, eh? <clears throat> Through TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube Shorts, short form content has become all the rage, and is also one of the cited reasons that a lot of people my age, your age, believe that our attention spans are shrinking. But the problem is how we got onto this like rhetoric of thinking our attention spans were shrinking is well less than reputable. Now, this image depicted here in some very wet marker, how we got this. Now, in 2000, it was believed that humans had an attention span of 12 seconds. In 2015, we now have an attention span of 8 seconds. But goldfish have an attention span of 9 seconds. What? Our attention spans are lower than a goldfish. Astonishing. Now, this infographic depicted here was put on a study done by Microsoft. Now, was Microsoft trying to find how we can improve our attention spans? Was Microsoft trying to figure out why our attention spans are shrinking? No, they were just trying to figure out how to better market to us because money, money, money. Now, did they study to find this infographic? No. What actually happened is they got it from a website called Statistic Brain. Now, Statistic Brain is known for being extremely vague with their numbers, their research. And when people reach out saying, hey, how did you get this? How did you get this number? They just don't respond. Already off to a great start. Now, not only is attention span not a finite thing, like you don't look at something for eight seconds and immediately have to look at something else. That's not how attention spans work. And also, how do you measure the attention span of goldfish? How do you, you, you can't, that's not how it works. Like this, this, it's all myths. But the problem is, this then led to every website capturing their title, our attention spans are shorter than a goldfish. <sighs> so is that it? This attention span video has led to nothing. I've led to figuring out, oh, our attention spans aren't actually shrinking, it's just from a random infographic that aided Microsoft. Well, no. While the attention span shrinking, decreasing, was a dead end in my research, the study that Microsoft was doing did show one thing. And that is that companies are trying to fight for our attention. 
They're doing anything they can to keep our attention. But before we can talk about how they're doing that, we need to talk about dopamine. Now, dopamine, what is it? Well, dopamine is a neurotransmitter released by the ventral tegmental area of the brain, or the VTA. And it's a bad here. I apologize for the gross orange. But, annoyingly enough, it's the texture that works the most. I forgot to bring my textures and my markers, because I forgot. Anyway, so, the VTA, it releases dopamine. Now, most people, most people's conception of dopamine is it is what motivates us when we do certain things, like eating chocolate. Now, there are four different pathways that dopamine can take through the brain. Now, we only care about two of them: the mesolimbic and the mesocortical. Now, the mesolimbic starts at the VTA, that's where it all starts, and it goes to here does not need to go very far in the brain. It goes to the nucleus accumbens. Oh yeah, nucleus accumbens. All the way to here. Nucleus. Uh, I cannot write this like accumbens. Now, nucleus accumbens is responsible for craving. The feeling of craving, like when someone just quit, quit drugs and they've got like this super like massive urge to do them. That's because of that. That's because of that bad boy. Now, this pathway activates when you do things like eat fatty foods, eat sugary foods, do drugs, have sex, do all the like good things in the world. Not good things, but very like high stimulating things. And it only takes this super short pathway goes from there to there, or as most people would say, that's, that, that's the path of instant gratification. This is also the path that is that gives dopamine the name of being motivation and reward, because you crave it, you're motivated to go get it, and you want that instant reward. Boom, mesolimbic pathway. Now, the mesocortical pathway starts at the VTA, there's the little thing, and goes all the way through here. It's a much, 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 much longer pathway. Now, where does the mesocortical pathway take dopamine? Well, not only does it go through the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for attention and planning, but it goes through a very, very, very important part of the brain, about here, and it's called the anterior cingulate cortex. What does the anterior cingulate cortex do you, I hear you asking? Well, the anterior cingulate cortex is the part of the brain that does cost evaluation. So it says, hey, I need to do this later. If I do a little bit now, don't have to do as much later. It also helps in planning ahead. It helps when, basically, it's the part of the brain that makes you plan long-term goals. The part that helps you do assessments. The part that helps you say, I'm going to study for this test now. It'll be way easier later on. However, these, these pathways, they're cool, right? You do this one when you eat chocolate. You do this one when you do your assessment. But they, you can't just use them willy-nilly. You can't just go back and forth. I'm going to use this one now. Use that one later. Unfortunately, they found with people who ate very high palatable foods, such as having takeaway almost every day, that they use the mesolimbic pathway. That's what high fatty foods, high sugary foods do. But the more they used it, it ended up desensitizing the mesocortical pathway. It meant they stopped using it. They trained their brain to only use this pathway. Now, the mesolimbic pathway does things, as we discussed, drugs, food. But the problem is, it can also do something and uses something. The internet. Oh, gasp. Yes. The mesolimbic pathway has been found to be activated when we do our favorite little internet searching. This study was done on TikTok. Now, they found that watching personalized videos and general videos have the same reaction, but personalized videos have a bigger reaction in the brain. 
It, relu- it releases oh, all the dopamine. So much dopamine. It is so much fun. So many pretty colors. So many different noises. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So they found that not only through using TikTok over and over and personalized videos and short form content led to using the mesolimbic pathway, but it led to deactivation of the anterior cingulate cortex. These, this short form content is quite literally designed to turn off the part of the brain that is responsible for telling you, hey, maybe we should turn this off and go do something, go do the dishes we've been putting off for the past three hours. It is designed to turn off the part of the brain that tells you to stop engaging with the substance. Now, you're hearing this, and the internet is supposed to be a great thing, right? It's the reason you can watch this. It's the reason a lot of people can pursue education, because we have all these resources at our disposal, thanks to the internet. But the key here is moderation, and the humans are... Super bad at moderation, clearly. Now, what have we learned? That's right. Short form content in TikTok, Instagram, YouTube is quite literally designed to rewire your brain to seek it out. Rewires your brain to stay engaged with it. Rewires your brain to only take the path of instant gratification. It is way easier to watch TikTok videos and get all your dopamine that you need instead of planning ahead and going, man, if I get some work done now, I will feel way more accomplished. Your brain, due to barely using this, goes, man, that will take less than a few seconds. That is so difficult. Let's just scroll on TikTok. Your brain is trained to seek out these videos and only engage with them. Darn it. Let's assume, for whatever reason, you don't have TikTok. Well, as we discussed, all forms, all, almost all forms of, not even just social media, but all forms of the internet have short form content on it now because they saw TikTok's success and went, yep, we'll have some of that. But even if you don't, if you just use the internet, if you, just, if you don't watch short form content, if you watch full 15 minute videos, if they're personalized, they have the exact same reaction to a lesser extent, but they still have the, that reaction because they're personalized videos with all the fun colors and pretty audio noises that make your brain go, oh, this is awesome. Let's do this all the time and reinforce this behavior. Let's play even more devil's advocate. Let's assume you don't watch any form of online content. Nothing. You don't watch YouTube. You don't watch Instagram Reels. But you have a phone, which means you message. Maybe you have Instagram to message your friends. Maybe you have Snapchat to message your friends. Or maybe you just have maybe you just have a phone number. Well, one of the problems with our phones and the internet and communication over these things is yes, it is a cool thing that we are able to communicate to people who live long, long ways away. Like I can communicate to my auntie all the way in England. But the problem with this is it creates the same dopaminergic buzz in our brain that actual face-to-face interaction does. So while we go outside and get this interaction, we can get it through our phones. You get the same buzz from face-to-face interaction that you get from the phone. So, with this, the average adult in the US will play on their phone, or not even play on their phone, just touch, be holding their phone for a total of three and a half hours throughout the day. That's the average. Through typing, swiping, texting, tapping, it results in about 2,600 consecutive different touches of the phone which I'm sure you can imagine isn't a good way to be spending, but yeah, but nearly four hours of your day. So where am, where am I getting out with all this? Well, if you use the internet in any conventional sense, whether it's watching content, whether it's using it to message people in any normal conventional sense, like if you're like the average person, in terms of your brain and your dopamine health, you're kind of doomed. 
But you're sitting there. I don't care. I, I don't mind only being able to choose the most instant path of gratification. I don't care about not being able to pursue anything that takes longer than a few seconds. I don't care. Of course you do. Well, if you don't care about being able to pursue stuff outside of it only lasting a few seconds, there are a slew of health issues that come with excessive internet and especially phone use. Now, there's been many, many links to depression and anxiety stirring from a lot of internet usage. The main reason is because it is, as we said previously, a crutch for face-to-face -face interaction. But yes, it creates the same dopamine buzz in our brain, but we are social creatures. We need actual face-to-face -face interaction or we become depressed, we become anxious. Now, why do we become anxious? Well, because of the lack of face-to-face -face interaction, it leads to us becoming more socially awkward because we don't go outside. We don't communicate with other people outside of our like echo chamber of opinions and jokes. So you go outside, you get the negative health effects of, um, there's like even I've had it where our eye muscles now are weaker because we're used to having a screen this close to our face. It is awful. Now, with this, that's not the main part that I care about in terms of the issues. Excessive internet use and phone use has been linked to negatively affecting cognition. What's cognition? It is quite literally the ability to not only acquire, but to like put knowledge to use. So it is affecting your brain to absorb and be able to use the information you absorb. And then not only that, especially younger people who are growing up with this stuff, it trains them to engage in passive activities outside of being actually fully engaged. So how often do you see someone, same age as me, maybe a bit younger, watching TikToks on their phone while there's a movie playing? Because they're engaging in a passive activity and instead of being actively engaged with the movie. Or instead of going outside and doing something like going for a nice hike, they need to be passively engaged in something while they do it. Or they'll put it off to be passively engaged in something. And this leads to people not being able to fully engage with tasks later on in life. Now that I've given the full spiel about instant gratification, delayed gratification, all the negative health effects that come with using the internet, and the dopamine pathways that are being manipulated, I can take this off. And now, let's talk about Wally. Now, Wally, the lovable little trash compactor robot that has been tasked with cleaning up the glorified landfill site that humans have left Earth. The movie, for the most part, follows his journey into love when he finds Eve, who is a robot who's been tasked with finding organic life on Earth to prove that humans can come back because it is habitable because we can grow stuff now. So, we follow these two for the movie. It is super adorable. This movie is awesome. You need to go watch it. It is amazing. I don't care if you've watched it. Go watch it again so you can hear Wally say Eva and Eve say Wally. All we need to do. Now, it's a cute little story. But then, Eve finds a boot. Well, not a boot. Find, yes, finds a boot with a plant in it that Wally has found. So, they go up to the Axiom, which is the massive ship that is orbiting space, that is keeping the remaining humans, the survivors of the human race, alive. We got aboard the Axiom, we're happy for this little robot story. And then we see what's left of the human race, and it is absolutely shocking. Like, I remember being a kid and seeing it, and being like, oh, that's funny. 
And then now watching it as the age I am, I'm like, whoa, that is awful. So what did these humans look like aboard the Axiom? What is the remaining of the human race? Well, it, I'll be honest, it's a confronting one. The humans, question mark, <laughs> aboard the Axiom, are the, like, pinnacle of only taking the path, only being able to take the path of instant gratification, only being able to use their mesolimbic pathway. So, not only are these two quagsires super mega morbidly obese, which, as we discussed, high palatable foods, love the mesolimbic system. They love to reinforce the behavior. So it seems like eating quick food is the only thing you can do because but cooking food would just take so long. The dopamine would take forever to get here. No, can't do it. So super morbidly obese chonkers. No, but now, I meant now. They have these little chairs that float so they don't even have to walk around. They've got all this high palatable food that they click and it's delivered to them. They don't have to think about it. Instant gratification. But they have these screens that, can't, that pop out of their chairs that keep the screen this close to their face. Now, they've got the screens that go this close to their face. Our first, one of our first introductions to the people aboard the Axiom people, is um, two people are going side by side. And they are video chatting each other. They're next to each other. But they're video chatting each other with the screens that are this close to their face. And then they say, you want to go do some golf? So I'm like, oh, they're going to get out of the chairs. They're going to play golf. This is probably going to be funny because they'll like dawdle and all over. No. They get robots to play the golf for them while they watch the robots do it. So what is this an example of? Well, passive activities. They would rather watch someone do the golf not even someone, robots do the golf, then actually play golf. But then we've got John and Mary. Who are John and Mary? So John and Mary actually have their screens turned off. So wham, 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 wham. They get their screens turned off due to their interactions with Wally. So John, what happens with John? Well, John gets his turned off because Wally crashes into him. And originally he's a bit flustered. There's no screen in front of him. He has to come to terms with the fact that the, there is an outside world. And he can't get back into his chair. But then after, he doesn't seem too bothered. He was initially scared because he's like, he's got he's coming down off probably one of the like massive, massive hides of all time. And then we've got Mary, who while he actually like switches hers off. And she's not immediately fearful. Instead, she like looks up and she's like, whoa. The outside world, so beautiful. So then, while we're following Wally and Eve's story, we're actually watching Mary and John. They meet each other because they both don't have their screens on. They're so, like, instant gratification, they don't even know how to turn their own screens back on. So then, instead of going, oh, I've got to find a way to turn our screens on, they interact with each other. And then you see them become happier people. And not only that, they stop engaging with passive activities. They engage with real life activities. They engage with something. What do they do? They go, they find out they have a swimming pool. Do they go swimming? No. Well, they can't because they're bodies. But they kick around some water with another person. And they are much happier for it. You see them come out of their shell and it's amazing to see them. Why am I talking about all this? Why am I talking about floaty fat people on a spaceship? Why am I talking about a trash compactor robot? Well, I believe that John and Mary, the other humans aboard the Axiom, the film Wally, present a potential future. And not even like a, oh, like it could happen if like some very specific things happen. We could be leading very closely to becoming the humans like in Wally. I don't think we're going to be aboard an axiom. Maybe we'll turn Earth into a glorified landfill site. But I think 
humans will slowly, not even evolve, calling that uh, puts a shame on evolution. We will devolve into these like pathetic excuses for humans. We've got no drive, no ambition. All we do is seek out the most instant form of pleasure, even if it's not that pleasurable. And that's where we are heading. Through TikTok, through AI, through having technology slowly become closer and closer and closer and closer to our faces and more interwoven in our lives. Like, I could not pursue schooling without the internet. There are so many things you just need your phone for. Like, people who don't have phones are like, considered like weird. Like, how do you do anything in life? How do you do anything? Like, it is so interwoven, but our relationship isn't getting better. It, we're not harnessing this tool like it's meant to be. It's getting worse. And this is where I think we could be headed if we don't make a very, 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 very drastic change. Now, you might be asking why. Why would humans do this to other humans? Why would we create devices and create foods that manipulate our dopamine systems into potentially becoming humans like this. You've already seen people like who look like this, who've taken that instant gratification and applied it to food, or people who've done the same thing applied it to the internet. Well, there's a term for it called chronically online, where you spend majority of the day, like your waking hours on the internet. Or maybe you have a job, but as soon as you're not at work, you're on the internet, so you're chronically online. There is now Terms and phrases applied to people who only take the path of instant gratification. Why would we do this? Well, <clears throat> when in doubt, when there are humans involved, there is capitalism. That is right. I am doing what I was originally saying I was going to do. You really think I couldn't go unless I'm not talking about capitalism? Of course I'm talking about capitalism. Roll the timelines. Now, what is capitalism? Well, capitalism, for those who don't know, if you're watching this, you most likely live in a capitalist society, but capitalism is the economic and political system that believes that industry should be privately owned and ran for profit. Now, unfortunately, these industries often delve into those silly little human rights, like education, healthcare, food, should be run for profit and, you know, not considered, you know, human right. But what do I know? Now, before the 18th century and that Walt Adam Smith came along, we used, to, we used to trade stuff. We traded stuff, you know. Person B had something that person A wanted and person A had something person B wanted. So they would trade. This, for the most part, set the, like, foundation for capitalism. Because one of the core rules of capitalism is you need to care for not only your interests, but the other person's. If you don't care for their interests, they're not going to care for yours, and you're both not going to get what you want. So, you need to care for your interest, their interests, so you can make a cool trade. So, then capitalism came along. So for that, we're going we're gonna to write a little, we're going to draw a little, little hat. Cool little hat on him. Nice. Awesome. So this is Mr. Dingus. But now, capitalism is here. And Mr. Dingus, he has all his like necessary things. He doesn't need wheat from person B. He can get his own. He doesn't need anything from person B. But person B still needs stuff from person A. So, money, 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 money. Money comes along, which is like a universal trade item. Now, originally, it was made out of precious metals. That's what gave the money value. But now, it's like paper and plastic. So, it only has value because we as a society agree that it has value. So, you could make your own money. And if you can get enough people to agree that it's money, you can use it like money. Anyway. So, person B 
needs to get money so he can get silly little things like basic human rights, like bread. So, how does he get the bread? Well, someone has to make that bread. We're, so we'll have person A. He makes he makes bread. Yeah, he makes bread. He makes bread. Right. He makes bread. So person B wants bread from person A. Person A says, You have nothing to offer me. So you give me some money that I can actually use to go trade, trade for something I want. So he says, Okay, I will give you my money. And you give me bread because I need to eat because I'm a human that doesn't want to die. Now, money has been exchanged for bread. Person B still has to get this money. So he has to find another silly goose with a top hat to expend labor to work under them to get money to get bread. And it all comes full circle. But the problem is, yeah, the problem is capitalism is it causes massive wage inequalities, as you can tell, because Mr. Mr. Man, he not only gets people working under him, but gets money from their labor. So they're up. So the person who's selling him bread is going up. The person who he works for is going up, and he's staying yeah, right in the middle, right where he's always been, because he needs to work to live. They work and do things for their profit. So, let's pretend that Miss, Mr. Dingus Man, yep, this is, we'll call him Dingus, right? We'll write it right on his little shirt. Draw him a little tie. We'll call him Dingus. Now, Miss Dingus, he loves money. Money, 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 money. We want more money. So, what is he going to do? Well, Mr. Dingus Man is going to be very, very clever. And he's going to make a website. Now, for those who don't know anything about websites, how websites work, right, is they get money from traffic. What is traffic? Well, Traffic is people visiting the website. So, Mr. Man has TikTok. He makes TikTok. People visit TikTok. So people come, they visit, they go, whoa, look at all these cool videos. Wow, amazing. So, he outsources and he says, hey, you guys, you guys got um, products, right? I will let you put your ads on my TikTok in exchange for money. So, they give money to Mr. Dingus Man. Money. In exchange for their ads being potentially seen by all the people that are visiting. So, they're making money because the people who have ads are giving them money. The people who have ads are making money because people are buying their products after seeing it on the website. And what, ha what happens to us? What happens to the people who visit these websites? We get the slew of negative health effects that come from visiting it. And a little bit of money left in our pocket because we were silly enough to buy whatever was on this ad. Dingus wants to keep more people coming. Wants to make more money. Wants to, wants to get more people with ads. So, Mr. Dingus designs his little TikTok thing. By the way, everyone with a website does this. It's why we suddenly, everywhere has short form content because every, every single website is fighting to not only capture our attention, but to keep it. They want to keep us there, which is why they're designed to do things like shut off the interior cingulate cortex because they want to keep us there. And that is what the Microsoft study was studying. They were trying to figure out how to keep people, not only capture the attention, but keep them there. And that is what every website with content now does. So they can make more money. So, what can you do? Until we abolish capitalism, people are always going to try and make money. And unfortunately, 
our little brains love this stuff. So, we as a collective can't make a change. Not powerful enough anyway. There are too many hands in this cookie jar to abolish the system right now. But, there is something you can do to aid in not feeding this cycle as much. I'm not saying you're going to cut out full turkey. Col there is something you can do to stop feeding into this cycle. I'm not saying you're going to cut it out like full cold turkey, but you can stop. You can make dingus earn a little bit less money. You can make the people with ads earn a little bit less money. How can you do that? Well, there is three key steps that I believe that can help you do this. Okay, to conclude this lesson, video essay, internet thing, um, this has no, like, research. I didn't do any research for this part. But the reason I'm talking about this, I'm talking about Wally and dopamine, is because I am passionate about it. Because I have been through my own little hero's journey about trying to not only improve myself, but improve my relationship with technology. So this is actually, this is Mr. G's. This is my three-step guide. Three, not even steps, like just three things to keep in mind when you want to fix your relationship with technology. Step one, the morning. If you're, because technology is a part of our lives, right? So you should try to make sure it is like the last thing you do. Not in the last thing you do, but just not the first thing, right? Because, as we said, videos, content, messaging, they release a lot of dopamine. So, so you start your morning. Oh, I wake up. Oh, I'm going to watch some TikToks. Boom! Go immediately up. And then you have to go to work. And then you have to expect to enjoy your life when you're down here now, when you're up here earlier. How are you going to enjoy your day? You're just going to feel sluggish. So you should try and make sure, like just try and go like, if you're going to listen to music in the car, fair enough. But try and do as little phone, video, messaging if you need to, you can. Messaging, if you're help, if you're not, not like on like Snapchat, just like answering everyone, if you like have to answer a message because like, hey, can you do this when you come to work? Fair enough. But you should be reducing like no social media, no YouTube. Can that. No clicking on the TV while you eat breakfast. Your morning should be as internet free as you can. You get in the car, pop some tunes on Spotify. Boom. Those tunes will be way better because it's your first time to be like hear something that isn't your own thoughts. Then. Pacing. As I've said a few times, you cannot just quit cold turkey. The internet is literally a drug. It is a drug. It like when you quit it or quit like um you can't get to it. Like there've been like studies found that you experience like you experience withdrawal, you experience cravings. It is the same as a drug, obviously, to a not as dire effect. But still, you can't just cut out to cold turkey. You need to take it nice and slow. So, maybe day one, not even day one. It can be week one. You can take it as slow as you can because don't have a plan, plan to fail. You don't want to get to here and not be ready. You want to, con you don't want to just like waddle onto step two. You want to leap over it. So maybe week one, you just, you get up and your first 30 minutes, you're not allowed to um, go on your phone or go on the internet. Step two, you don't watch it or use the internet during mealtime. So no TV or no, like, flicking on your phone while you're eating and not really, like, thinking about your food. Then, not on the toilet, okay? Like, 73% of people use their phones on the toilet. 97% have their phone within arm's reach when they go to sleep. Step four, 
no internet or technology an hour before bed. And you just slowly climb it until it is used like a tool, like it should be, and not as a crutch. Now, big scary monster, idle hands. So, you've got your pacing yourself, you've got your free mornings. They say idle hands are the devil's playthings. Now, I, I, for the most part, agree with that. Your first 30 minutes, when you're first doing it, will feel like an eternity. You will be like, whoa, I am taking, like, this is, this is scary. Like, you're going to be thinking your own thoughts, and it's going to be a bit scary. Like, I don't like it. I just want to, like, not think. But if you want to make cool things like this, if you want to do anything worthwhile, you need to think your thoughts. But you can't just think thoughts all the time. You need to do something with this time and with these mornings that you're occurring. So, pick up anything that you deem as productive. It can be going to the gym in the morning. You're like, man, I've got, oh, I've got like three hours before work. I'm going to go to the gym instead of just like flicking on TikTok until I have to get ready. Boom, go to the gym. Do some watercolor painting. Do anything. Or, you know what I've been doing? I've been reading. I've always heard and I've always been intimidated by people who read. So, I've started reading. My first 30 minutes of the day, I read. So I've been reading, uh, this is the book I just started, it's Beyond Good and Evil by Friedrich Nietzsche. I recently finished The Prince and The Communist Manifesto. And this past few weeks, I've read more books than I read in the last two years. So I'm doing, I like to think I'm doing pretty well. So that's what you need to do. You need to have something to do or you'll just slip back into it. So how can people try and quit cigarettes? They can't just sit around in their house thinking about how much they want cigarettes. They need to go out and do stuff. So with all this, with your reducing like the first impact, pacing yourself and having something to do, I believe you, the viewer, can slowly and surely fix your relationship with not only your phone, but with the internet as a whole.